Welcome to our online service today. We meet together to worship God, to encourage each other, and to be equipped to serve Jesus in our community. Our call as disciples of Jesus is to share the gospel message, to commend the message to other people. The truths and realities of our faith we are called to share. Today we'll learn more about sharing the gospel, the importance of preaching the saving message of Jesus. Would you join me as we reflect on God's word and a few verses from Psalms and then as I lead you in prayer. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. Father, we come today to worship, praise and adore you, our creator, Lord and Redeemer. We worship you as a people whom you have made a little lower than the angels, a, a people you have crowned with glory and honour. In you and through your Son, Jesus Christ, we find the beginning and the end of all things. In Jesus, we find hope, forgiveness and the courage of new beginnings. We come as sinners in need of forgiveness. We come with concerns, worries and fears in need of your guidance. We come tired after a full week and a busy weekend in need of refreshment and recreation. We lift our eyes towards you today. Help us to be open to listen and hear your voice, to be receptive to your spirit working in us and to have our passion to serve you reignited. We come to join our will to yours to make your purpose ours and your love our love. We come in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen.
streets Jesus in the darkness over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus come to a time of offering in our service and we use this time to reflect on the things that God has given us so that we can give back to the work that he is doing. Why don't you join with me as I pray. Heavenly Father, help us to think about and notice the ways that you are at work in our world and in our lives. God, we ask that you would help us to reflect you to the people around us each and every day. God, help us to use the things that you have given us, our time, our money and our gifts, so that people may come to know you. We pray for wisdom as we do this both individually and as a church. We pray this in your son's almighty name. Amen. Will you join me in prayer? Our Father God, the Easter season is behind us for another year and the tomb remains empty. Alleluia, what a saviour. We come before you today as people whose lives are forever impacted by the astonishing events of that first Easter. Romans tells us, just as Christ, Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. So Lord, we ask that you will continue to help us to intentionally live this new life so clearly laid out in your word. Forgive us the times when we have been joyless, self-serving and neglectful of others and especially neglectful of you. Show us how to live out your very first commandment, to love you with all our heart, soul and mind and then to love others. We thank you for the many opportunities that our church has provided for us to show practical love by giving to Crossways, Global Interaction, Baptist World Aid and by supporting missionaries, our pastors and leaders and school workers. We thank you that there are people here willing to love and nurture our children and young people by teaching them in Sunday school and youth groups. But beyond our own concerns here in Epping, we look to the unspeakably terrible events across the world where hate and not love is the driving force. To Christians in these areas, Lord, we wonder how they can hold on. We marvel and praise you that so many can. We think of the many crimes against humanity, desperate border crossings, genocide, racism and extremism, 
we see appalling violations of the most basic human rights. We pray for minority groups who feel powerless and unrepresented across the world, in our own country, even in our own parliament. You alone, Lord, are all powerful. You alone bring, bright, bring light and hope. Help us to cast our minds to Calvary when the things of this world loom up to consume us. We are joyful that sin has lost its grip on all who believe. We are free to live this new life. We thank you and praise you, our Heavenly Father. Amen. Today there are two Bible readings. The first Bible reading is from Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 to 20, entitled The Great Commission. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. The second reading comes from 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 10 to 13 and it's entitled David's Prayer. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, O Lord, God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendour, for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom, you are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honour come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. So let us continue in our service today as we turn afresh to Matthew chapter 28. Of course, Matthew 28 is where we left off the story last week on Easter Day. 
Not only will we be looking at Matthew, but we're looking briefly at 1 of Chronicles chapter 29 and a beautiful poem of praise and worship. So turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28, beginning to look at verses 16 onwards. Let's come to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being with us today as we have joined together in worship. Continue to speak to us afresh, we pray, as we reflect and consider these words from Scripture. Speak by your Spirit into our lives that we might worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we begin a short three-week series on these verses from Matthew chapter 28. Commonly called the Great Commission. Today we look at worship, next week discipleship, and then finally mission. Now both Luke, Luke 24, 44 to 49, and John, John 21, 15 to 23, seemingly have passages that are similar of commissioning. But Matthew is clearly unique in these last five verses. These five verses in comparison to the length of the rest of Matthew seem really quite short. Matthew, of course, is the longest gospel. Now, last week, one phrase abounded, dominated. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Today, worship, discipleship, and mission dominate. And these are our themes spread over the next three weeks. Michael J. Wilkins says, themes that have characterized this gospel are here culminated and untied. Here, first of all, Jesus' unique authority as divine Son of God demands the worship of his followers. We see this again as a theme throughout Matthew in chapters 1 and 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapters 14 onwards, and so on. Jesus' form, secondly, of discipleship transcends ethnic, gender, and religious boundaries to form a new community of faith called the church. Again, chapters 12, 16, and 18 help us to see that more fully. Thirdly, Jesus' final move to call all nations together is proclaimed in preaching of the gospel of the kingdom of God. And again, we see this through Matthew's gospel. And then finally, or fourthly, Jesus' call to inside-out righteousness is experienced through obedience to his teachings, as with baptism, as the fulfillment of God's will for his people. There is so much in Matthew's gospel and so much here in these last five verses. It follows beautifully on from the phrase, he is risen, as it highlights again the miraculous resurrection of Jesus, highlighting his authority over death and indeed his role in altering human history once and for all. By developing his covenant salvation from the tribe of Israel to nations everywhere, Matthew continues to call us to worship the risen king. Hallelujah. For the first time in Matthew's narrative, we read that the disciples encounter the risen Jesus and their response is to worship him. His true identity is revealed as the Son of God. Time and again, the disciples have struggled to comprehend his role and purpose in bringing about the kingdom of God. But here, but here, after 28 chapters, we find fulfillment. It is a wonderful passage and has been used and preached on countless times across many centuries. But for many, there remains one problem, one single problem, but some doubted. What does it mean? Why is it here? First and foremost, it's just an honest reflection. Hallelujah, it's an honest reflection. But there may be some reasons for this. Jesus is not the same as he was before the resurrection. Puzzled, doubt takes over. It implies that some of the 11 ultimately refused to believe. But more likely that some took longer to accept the reality of the resurrection than others. A bit like Thomas. Remember Thomas? The commentaries suggest that the Greek verb does not denote a settled unbelief but a state of uncertainty and hesitation. Which of us 
in our lives have not had uncertainty? Which of us has never hesitated? Secondly, all of them perhaps doubted as they came to full belief. Uncertainty faced leads to a stronger faith. John 21 verses 4 to 7 mentions that they saw him at a distance. Perhaps he was hard to see to begin with because of the distance. I know over the years my eyes have got worse, not better. That in the past, thirdly, others were present, as they had been in the past with the disciples. But they're not mentioned specifically, and nor are they mentioned here. Perhaps it was them that was doubt, that doubted. R.T. France, a New Testament commentator, mentions that it might have been the heavenly brightness that blinded them, believing them to have seen a ghost. Seeing Jesus alive and sovereign, the fog of Golgotha turns to the light of resurrection, as now seen in Galilee. Last week on Easter Day, we looked at both the resurrection appearances in Matthew 28, verses 9 and 17. Both verses, you will remember, led the women and the disciples to worship. The women fell at his feet and worshipped him. Verse 9. The disciples, when they saw him, worshipped him. Verse 17. The proper response to Jesus then and now is worship. To worship him. Why? Because Jesus shares the nature of God, who alone is to be worshipped. The claims of sonship throughout the gospel are validated by the resurrection. He is risen. He is risen indeed. The risen one comes to them and claims all power and authority. He promises that he will be with them and they will be with him on their world and he will be with them in their worldwide mission wherever they go until the very end of the age. Whilst also highlighting the importance of discipleship to the worldwide church. But more of that in the weeks to come. This is all part of the Great Commission, which springs from worship. As the women and the disciples fall down in total adoration of Jesus, they are lost in wonder, love, and praise. Both evangelism and discipleship spring from a true knowledge of who Jesus is, that is found in true worship and overflows from a Christian community where worship is primary. Do you notice this overflowing is always directed outward to the unreached? As those wishing to grow in their discipleship want to share the good news of Jesus with others. Otto Michel says, The whole gospel was written under this theological premise, that all authority has been invested in Christ, who is therefore worthy of worship as the divine Son of God. Hegner states that these verses are the hallmark of the Gospel of Matthew. For these words, perhaps more than any other, distill the outlook and the various emphasis of the Gospel. As I reflect on this short passage at the end of Matthew, of course, it's not only Jesus that is to be worshipped. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I ponder on what worship actually means. I can't find who said this, but I like what it says. True worship will nurture our relationship with God, awaken our wonder of salvation, and open us to the empowering of the Holy Spirit, and make us more ready to obey his word. May that be true for you and indeed for me. I like that quote, but I particularly love this next one by William Temple. William Temple was, of course, the Bishop of Manchester in the 1900s, before becoming Archbishop of York and then ultimately Archbishop of Canterbury. He said this, Worship is the submission of all of our nature to God, it is the quickening of our conscience by his holiness, the nourishment of mind with his truth, the purifying of imagination by his beauty, the opening of the heart to his love, the surrender of will to his purpose. All this gathered up in adoration, the most selfless emotion of which our nature is capable. What a brilliant, brilliant quote to help us to reflect on the nature and purpose of worship.
Now, you know our second reading came from the Old Testament, from 1 Chronicles 29, a personal favorite of mine. Let me read it to you once again. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor, for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now to our God, we give you thanks. We praise your glorious name. A beautiful passage outlining the worship of God in wonderful prose. Dr. Martin Selman, was one of my tutors at Spurgeon's and writes in the Tyndale Commentary on Chronicles. He says this, this magnificent prayer demonstrates beyond contradiction that Chronicles' priority is with the heart of worship rather than its form. Its interests is centered not on David or the temple, but on God himself and his kingdom. God's kingdom is not only the object of praise, but the source of the wealth of the people. I always remember at our end of year graduation, Martin was our keynote speaker that particular year and one of the worthies got up to introduce him. And in that introduction, he, he listed Martin's many accomplishments. And then he said, went on to say that we were very fortunate today to have the author of One and Two Chronicles come and speak to us. Well, that would have been a, an interesting and magnificent event. But what of course he meant was that Martin was the author of one or two Chronicles, the Tyndale series. We certainly had a laugh at Martin's expense there. But the central focus of this, and indeed any worship of God, is that God is the supreme head and ruler of his kingdom. All things come from you, and of his own have we given him. Now, in modern Christianity, we've come to appreciate something of the height, depth, and indeed breadth of Christian worship. What we still need to learn, however, is that it is not about us. It's not about us and what I like, whether I like hymns or songs, liturgical prayers, or extemporary prayers. It's not about us. Rather, it is about God and moving ourselves in line to be in line with his will and his spirit. As we come to worship God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it's about coming under his authority, that the whole of our lives is shaped and modeled on him. Sadly, from one church, we now have over 40,000 different traditions or denominations. However, in a brief uh, search of the internet, I found this particular article that says there are just 300, just 300 major ecclesiastical traditions worldwide, with countless breakout ones within each one, of course. And it goes on to say that it's grouped into six ecclesiastical cultural mega blocks. I'll leave you to look those up and have a look at them. But I like what C.S. Lewis says as he reflects on the majesty and the glory of God as seen in worship. A man can no more diminish God's glory by refusing to worship him than a lunatic can put out the sun by scribbling the word darkness on the walls of his cell. In ending, I want to share with you two further quotes from well-known 21st century worship leaders. Worship is more than singing beautiful songs in church on a Sunday. It is more than instruments and music. As a true worshipper, your heart will long to worship him at all times, in all ways, and with all of your life. That's what Darlene says. Matt Redmond says this, in the end, worship can never be a performance, something you're pretending or putting on. It's got to be an overflow of your heart. Worship is about getting personal with God, drawing close to God. I pray that actually today you may worship God afresh and in doing so, get personal with him and draw close with him.
In conclusion then, as Christians, we are called not only to be disciples and missionaries, but first and foremost, we're called to worship God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in setting out each Sunday and indeed every single day we begin to reveal our purpose and reason for living, that of worshipping the one triune God. Now, if you're listening online, take a moment to reflect on these quotes that I've put up from William Temple, from Matt and from Darlene and from C.S. Lewis, etc. Take a moment to reflect on these quotes and then read afresh Matthew 28, 16 to 20. And may the Spirit move afresh in your life to give you a bigger picture, a bigger understanding, a bigger knowledge, a more humble picture of yourself, but a bigger picture of God, the one true God that we worship. God bless. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these words from Matthew and from 1 Chronicles 29. May they speak afresh into our lives today as we grasp how you wish to speak into our lives, not just each Sunday, but every single day. Renew our trust in you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless. Show
So we close our service today with these wonderful words from Colossians. Having had a service of worship, where we have worshipped afresh, where we've looked at two passages that speak of the authority of Jesus. We come now to close our service with these words. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile himself to all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross.' 